to working on this church has been a huge honor to work on the church. Um, it was interesting. We started, I started looking at this building back in 2016 with Dave Rodriguez, and that's when I first met um, Cliff. And we've, we started flying drones all over it, and I think we did like three or four drone flights, and then I pretty much wrote like a, a book on what was up there. Um, a lot of things that I discovered that were just incredible. And, you know, for my personal Christian faith, they were really edifying. I started working with my father when I was 12 years old, and I ended up working with my dad for about 21 years. And I've been involved doing uh, historic preservation work for about 30 years now. Um, so we're just going to get right into the, uh, the work that we did and a little bit of the history of the church and what's been done to the building in the past. Um, so this is an outline. Everybody likes to know an outline because they like to know when the, when the preacher is going to stop preaching, right? So we have one, two, and three. Um, so the first thing we're going to discuss is the, the history of the spire, uh, design and construction. We're going to talk about prior repairs to the structure and what we were able to accomplish this past year. Uh, and then part three will be a summary of uh, the recent spire inspection, which we did in December. We had a 125 foot uh, boom lift on the Fifth Street right here. And we were able to take a look at what's going on up top and really what needs to be repaired. So if you don't know it, the picture on the far left over there that's what your church originally looked like. Does everybody know that? That it was a brick structure, had a brick facade, so I believe it was built in 1825. Is that right? Okay, just tell me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think it was 1825 that was constructed. I think it looks like the Damascus Gate or something over in Jerusalem, you know, it must have been that design. Um, so right here we have a couple of pictures. Has everybody seen these pictures before? Okay, um, so we have this is actually when, I think Cliff and I talked about it, it might be in the late 1800s, right? Where you can see the scaffolding up at the top of the steeple. Supposedly there was a major storm and lightning had struck the steeple and they needed to reinforce the steeple. So they put a large rod up the inside of the steeple and this rod is probably about this big, okay? And it runs the, the last, I would say, probably 30 to 50 feet. Um, and I have a picture of that rod because I was up in there and I took a picture of it. But that's just such an amazing picture because the scaffolding doesn't go to the ground and I don't think the guys had harnesses at that time. Um, but we have another picture here which you really can't see real well because of this shadow. It's like in the 20s or 30s. Um, and you can see on these pictures the buildings that were built up against Christ Church. Um, now this right here is actually a postcard that I bought off of eBay last week. And it's right here. It was the only one. It's from 1906 and uh, it was printed in Germany. Um, and so I found it last week. I put Christ Church in and I thought, I better buy this thing. It was like 12 bucks. Um, so I scanned it in there and it's really cool because it shows what I believe is the hot dog stand that Cliff told me about <laughs> right here where the awning is. Um, but there were two, there were buildings on either side. And so those are just some pictures. These are some really cool advertisements from the Reading Times um, talking about the sale of the old brick back in 1863 when they tore the facade down. And then uh, right here, somebody lost the, the drawings for this church. And so they were asking a kind uh, you know, fellow citizen of Reading to return the lost drawings, which is kind of a funny thing to see. Um, but then down here, we have what they were paying uh, stonemasons at the time. Uh, I think it's either two to five dollars a day. Is that right, Cliff? So obviously inflation has happened. So let's go to the next slide then. So this is a picture that I took this past summer when the clouds were rolling in and it looked uh, a little bit like Mount Sinai. As you look up, you know, you're seeing the clouds roll in. So I uh, just, uh, this is the brief history of the church. Your church was designed by a man, uh, the additions to the church was designed by a man named Edward Tuckerman Potter. And he was a, a preeminent um, uh, architect in the mid to late 1800s. And he uh, had a really interesting family history. We'll get into that in the next slide. 
Um, but he built about 10 churches. Uh, a lot of them were Episcopalian churches uh, from Connecticut all the way out to Illinois. He built a lot of churches. Um, so this church was constructed in, I believe, around 1864, uh, right in the middle of the Civil War, towards the end of the Civil War. Uh, and it was constructed out of locally sourced uh, Berks County brownstone. Um, it's completely unique. The architecture is completely unique to the surrounding area and, and to Berks County, even to Lehigh County. Um, the church was modeled after St. Patrick's Cathedral, uh, and it is a neo-Gothic style, which means new Gothic. Um, so they modeled it after old cathedrals of Europe, uh, like the ones in Cologne, Germany. Um, it has a 200-foot uh, spire, which is very unique. It's a stone spire. It's not uh, slate on top. It's full stone all the way to the top, and it is listed on the historic uh, registry, uh, National Historic Registry. So this is the gentleman that designed it, uh, Edward Tuckerman Potter, and he was the son of a uh, bishop, uh, Alonzo Potter. Um, he was a, a very well-known bishop from that time period, from the early 1800s, uh, and his father actually passed away in 1865, right after this church was, uh, the construction was finished. Uh, he was one of 10 children, and it's a pretty uh, amazing, prominent family from that time period. Uh, he designed Mark Twain's house. Uh, he's best known for that. He also had a real love for the scriptures, and he wrote a, uh, a children's book. It's actually a, a composition of just straight biblical narrative, and he broke it down and wrote a, a children's book at that time because he felt like kids could, children needed to be able to absorb, you know, the Word of God, and they were capable of understanding it. So this is really interesting. Uh, when we flew the drone, uh, we discovered that there's an inscription up there that Potter had put on the building. And so if you see this right here, you'll see an E. The resolution isn't really that great, but there's an I, N, V, and then it's a T and an M. And the Latin abbreviation for inventor and TM obviously is trademark, uh, which I've never seen anything like that on a building. So he was obviously um, really pleased with the design and uh, just thought it was a really interesting thing to see. So we're gonna go over the uh, design of the spire and what makes it unique. Uh, it has a 200 foot uh, brownstone steeple on top. It has four column finales right here. You see three of them right there, obviously. And there is ornamentation that fell off of those. Uh, it has 32 gargoyles on and 32 individually different uh, hand-carved brownstone uh, gargoyles. And um, these gargoyles each have a shield that they hold out in front. It's actually, the side of it is, is and that was that first slide, it shows a gri they're a griffin. They're called a griffin. It's like an, an ancient mythical be being. Um, but each one of those uh, gargoyles hold out a different scriptural reference on a shield. And it's just incredibly unique. And I was super blessed when I was looking at the, the dr drone footage and thinking, no one ever sees this, but it's all up there. And it was all part of what was designed by, by Potter. The Latin inscriptions, you have two Latin inscriptions on the front, uh, and those Latin inscriptions say, I am the light of the world, is what it says. And of course, we know that Jesus said that. And he also said that the church uh, is to be the light of the world. It has flying buttresses, uh, which are up top, and a flying buttress is basically uh, helping to uh, strengthen the spire, but it's something that you would see on big cathedrals like Notre Dame. And then multiple deep stone archways. You can just see the archways all over the place on this building. So this is the Latin inscription here. It's Lux Mundi. Am I pronouncing that correctly? That's a Latin inscription. It means light of the world, and here's the scriptural reference. You know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And obviously that's the, uh, that's also the uh, alpha and the omega right there. This was interesting. As I was doing the research on the building, there's three big arches, and these arches look like gates up on the top part of the, uh, the, the tower. And if you read the book of Revelation, it says that the New Jerusalem that God's gonna make in the end of, uh, of all, all things, will have three gates, one on the north, one on the south, one on the east, and one on the west. And so I just thought that was really interesting. 
Um, here's a close-up of these are the shields that are directly over the front door here. And you can see the griffin, and he's holding the face of a man and the face of a lion. Now, what's interesting about this is that there's, there's a kind of a double meaning here because this is called the tetramorph, and it's the early church fathers had a, they had basically a symbol showing the four gospels, and that those four gospels represented each, each one of those gospels had a repre representation of an animal that symbolized those gospels. And so we see the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. But those also go back to a scriptural reference from the book of Ezekiel uh, when he was in, uh, exiled in Babylon, and then also in the book of Revelation. So it's just incredible uh, symbolic uh, representations of, of, the, uh, of the scriptures here. So uh, this is a grapevine that's uh, carved in, and obviously we know the, the verse from John 15, 5, where Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will, he will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Here we have uh, the Lamb of God shield and the grape shield, both uh, uh, you know, biblical references to uh, you know, the Lamb of God being Christ himself, and the grapes, uh, the multiple uh, you know, fruit of the vine, multiple uh, scriptural references as well. At the base of the spire, you have these buttress uh, supports that come down into an octagonal uh, column. Here's a close-up side profile of a griffin. Um, each one of these are completely unique. When you stand in front of them, they're all hand-carved and a work of art in and of themselves. So underneath the shelf uh, where the bell room floor is, there's, there's flowers and bells. You can see the chimes that are hand-carved into those. Uh, this, I thought, was a really interesting shield. Obviously, we all know symbol for early Christianity is uh, the fish, the ichthys. Is that, am I pronouncing that right, Father Duck? Um, and so you have the ichthys, and then that's the Jerusalem cross, I believe, which is another ancient uh, you know, Christian symbol. Uh, these are the other two uh, tetramorphs on the front here of the ox and the eagle. And uh, I find this really interesting, too, because if you look at the verse from the book of Revelation, it says, the first of these living beings was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third was, had a human face, and the fourth, like an eagle in flight. And they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and who was and who is to come. It's pretty profound that that's right on the front of your church, that you walk into that uh, building every day. So obviously, Potter had all this in mind, and from his background of growing up in the church, had this scriptural knowledge. Front archway, I'm sure many of you have, have stood there and, and looked at it, but it's incredible the depth of it. Uh, also the iron work, it's all hand forged on the front there. Okay, this is part two. Uh, this is the prior repairs of the structure and what we did uh, this past year working on it. Uh, this is actually repointing with um, lime mortars from France uh, and we uh, recreated the original profile and the color and texture of the joint the way it was originally designed and to function. Okay, so this just backtracks a little bit. Uh, we have what we did in 2016 when Dave Rodriguez uh, first flew the drone on. Uh, we did a comprehensive survey uh, of the overall tower, the inside, the exterior, uh, with Scott Gold, uh, who's a friend of mine from Lockridge Engineering, and uh, we wrote a report to document that. This is the inside of your tower. Um, you can see some of the interior stone work there. This is that rod I was telling you about. And you basically get up into the spire and you get to a point where your shoulders are touching stone on either side. And then there's this massive rod that comes down the center and it ties into two railroad ties, which are probably from the Reading Railroad at some point. But uh, they put that, that rod in, which is unbelievable. So why did we have to do the work that we did uh, this past summer? And it's because of the a lot of what I'm going to say here is probably going to be repeated throughout the, the uh, presentation, but it has to do with the mortar that, and the repairs that have been done in the past. They weren't done in keeping with the strength of the stone. They weren't done in keeping with uh, the original look of, of the building, and that contributed to a lot of uh, deterioration, and it's still happening on the tower right now. You can see how the stone is flaking really badly, 
And that is because of the cement mortar that was applied over top. Cement mortars have a real low uh, vapor permeability, real high, high strength, uh, compressive strength, and they're a lot harder than the original mortars that the building was constructed with. So they tend to cause this kind of deterioration. Okay, and so what we found was that when they had repointed this back in probably the 40s or 30s, uh, they had gone over top of the original mortar. So we saw what the original color was, the original joint profile, and we were able to get that mortar analyzed, and they wrote a whole report on how that mortar was made, and we were able then to match that mortar with the materials from France. Okay, so here's a picture of some of the deterioration. This is the back archway over here next to uh, M&T Bank, and you can see how the stone is being eroded from the hard mortars. Every time there's a freeze-thaw cycle where the, where the wall gets wet and then it holds moisture in and it freezes, it deteriorates the stone more and more. And then, of course, you can't really see it that well, but this is the, uh, what I like to call the rod of Aaron that was up top. And it was a tree that was growing out, and it was probably about that, about that big in diameter and we cut it out and uh, brought it down safely, but it was about 10 feet tall. So remember in that first picture how I showed you how there were buildings up against the side of your church? When those buildings were removed, the cement, uh, the walls were exposed, and those walls were never meant to be exposed. The stone was actually stacked. Instead of the stone being tied together like this, it was stacked one on top of another, and then they had plastered over it in the 1940s with a hard cement plaster. Now what happened was water was still trapped in there and it was just eroding the whole inside of the wall. It was waterlogged. So, and you can see there's plants growing out. Anytime you see plants growing on a building, it's not a good thing. So, now this is the sample of the work that we, we did. Once we had the mortar analyzed and made, then we basically put a sample up to get approval on the color and the, the joint profile. And you can see the um, cement mortar here, that's the replacement mortar, but then this was what originally the building would have looked like. And that's the mortar removed. These are just a couple of still shots of us doing the work. Okay, now I think I'm going to turn the speakers on and you guys can watch a little movie. See some more of the uh, deterioration of the stone and the stonework here. So this is what we'll be removing right here. I don't even know if I can pry this out or not. It looks like I might be able to pull it out. Basically, that's the hard mortar. And in here is the bedding mortar. So we'll be removing this. This, we think, was installed in the 1930s, 1940s. Um, and this is a hard cement mix, uh, which is obviously causing this deterioration. We're going to put that nice streamlined uh, profile in. It's an overhung ridge joint, so it'll be a really nice joint to accent the stone. I'm going to give the stone a washing, a light washing, and um, clean it up a little bit, but nothing too crazy. We're, we're trying to really conserve the, uh, the stone work itself. Look, you see this light purple joint that's kind of popping through, and so that's what our mortar is really going to try to uh, replicate see it up here so when this was repointed in the past they simply just went right over top of the original and uh, kind of encapsulated that in cement so we're working on removing uh, the mortar joints to give you an idea of what that looks like we're working on uh, this section here has been uh, completed and we've removed the old mortar joints, being very careful about all these decorative edges. And afterwards, we would wash down the wall and rinse everything so that it, um, so that it actually gets rid of any debris or dirt that would prevent adhesion. 
So this is what I actually do for my day job here. And, uh, but, uh, so they come from a place called Saint Astier, uh, France, and uh, the Romans discovered that if they burnt this limestone, that they could build their aqueducts and the mortar would set up underwater and have incredible strength. They've been used since about 30 AD is what it says here. And this is the same mortar that Notre Dame was built out of. Um, they're using it currently in the process of restoring it right now. So this style joint is called an, uh, it's called an overhung ridge joint. And so there's different joint profiles, historic profiles that accented the stone. And this was originally the way that they did it. Um, they used a straight edge, they cut it across, they beveled the joint so that the joint was proud of the stone. That way when water hits the wall, it is able to flow over the wall. It creates like little drip edges down and it really gives a long lasting repair. So if a job like this is properly done, the mortar should last anywhere, depending on the exposure, but it could be up to 100 years before it needs to really be replaced again. I've actually worked on a few properties that have the original lime mortars from like the 1790s, 1780s. And here we have a progress shot. We're doing some of the overhung ridge joint pointing. And uh, this was all cut, and the guys are working on cutting it over there. Um, still needs to be brushed. It's coming out pretty good. Squaring. It can be reworked in 24 hours. Um, yeah, because it sets by absorbing air, uh, so it, it stays as long as you keep it closed off from air. You can kind of rework it. It's really a neat. We have all of our burlap up sun shield protection. So we have to protect the mortar as it's drying. That's what makes it different from modern mortars. So we put up burlap, wet burlap. We kind of create a nice cool area to work in and then we hang burlap over the walls for uh, three days and we keep everything misted and uh, curing nice and slow. This was an area that was in really bad repair and so uh, St. Astier also makes a brownstone restoration patching compound made out of the lime which basically simulates the stone. It's kind of like dentistry for stone. And so if you have a cavity, you get a small you know, filling put in and that's essentially what, uh, what we did here to restore this. And all these materials are breathable. They work with the, material, with the stone. You can see how destroyed that was and how crisp everything is. Resolution isn't really that good here, but uh, you can get, get an idea for it. So it's toned to different colors, textures and shapes. My background was in art. I was, a, uh, I was into drawing and painting, so this is fun to me, you know, to be able to do. But there's the original uh, structure with the buildings uh, connected on either side. And you can see this building here on the right, how it's, that's where the M&T Bank is. You can see where that post comes down. That's, these are gonna be the two areas that I show you that we restored with um, new brownstone. So, Obviously these buildings were taken away. It was plastered up and this plaster, this hard cement plaster was about three inches thick. It was like concrete there and it was trapping moisture in the cavity of the wall. And over time that can cause the walls to expand, of course, and uh, accelerate you know, the deterioration. So the first thing we did was we uh, braced everything with structural bracing uh, based off what our structural engineer recommended. So we're here on the end column and we're beginning the restoration work of these stones. And what we're finding is, is that uh, stone underneath here, the mortar is very, very wet. Um, has been waterlogged for quite some time. Uh, this particular structure right here, the stonework was up against another building. 
And so the stonework wasn't finished real well. And then at one point when they removed the building, they just plastered over it with a Portland cement, which is trapping the moisture in the wall. And so what we have to do is prop this with steel angle down to the ground, put an angled prop right there and a horizontal beam with a post right here and support the stonework. And then we can make modifications to the column here and remove remove some of the stone and put tie stones in so that the stonework is properly tied. And so that's what we're working on here today. We're just beginning this process and we'll take some more videos along the way. You can see the massive deterioration here and how this wall was not. You see how the stones are stacked constructed. right on top of each other? And that's not the proper way to tie a corner. On the inside. There was a building right here. It was actually a hot dog stand. That was I had to mention that, time, you know. <laughs> so eventually the church bought the area where the hot dog stand was and uh, they demolished the building and they were able to make a really nice uh, courtyard area. So this is kind of an amazing thing, but we met a gentleman when I was doing the Harb uh, meeting that had brownstone from a building that was torn down eight years ago. He had it on his property. It matched your church exactly. All the stone sizes were exactly the same sizes that I needed, like within an inch or a half inch, which this stone is not commercially available anymore. Okay, so, which is pretty incredible. In some of these pieces of brownstone here, and we have feathers and wedges set up. This is a traditional way of dividing a stone. Hopefully, this split this is back at our, right our property where we worked on this. Go ahead and get started there. Now, Logan does not hit typically this fast, but I just sped it up a little bit. So. <laughs> there she goes. Keep working it, Logan. Work the crack at the end there. Oh, she split off at the end. Sorry for my play-by-play. Play. I get, we get, right. get kind of into it, so. It's pretty good cut. Let's see what we got. And then that's the stone divided. And they did this. I mean, you think about how much work. Now, this is a diamond chainsaw that I use. This is sped up as well. Um, we use these Italian diamond chainsaws to cut things and shape. And then we do all our hand shaping. So we rough it in, um, move the stones around. I made, we made templates and measurements for every single stone because every single stone was different. And then the faces were textured to match the, the exterior of uh, the outside of your building here. They're incredible workers, they really are. Um, so these are all the stones then, uh, and that's my piece of uh, sacred piece of cardboard that I had all the measurements written on. Uh, and then, you know, when you're gonna cut into a building like this with a diamond chainsaw, you wanna make sure you cut once. And so I took a bunch of measurements, and here we have stone. We're gonna put in for a tie stone on front here. Originally there was no tie stone here, so we're gonna cut this out. Insert this piece of reclaimed brownstone here. We have shaped. You can see how nice that's going to blend in, We're obviously. Setting it up and making sure everything fits. This was a really tight spot to work and we had to work, I had to work this saw so it goes up without it kicking out and it has a lot of power so you have to be very careful the way you do this type of work and not overcut the joint to uh, mess up the rest of the stone. So you can see how they're notched out real carefully there. And you want to make sure you don't put a you know, big fat joint in there, so you, you have to be really careful to, to cut it just right. We brought all the stone in for each side then, on the back of our flatbed. 
And, uh, and then we had to work the stone here a little bit at a time and dry fit every single stone before we uh, started inserting them. So this is what we did all summer. And then we took wood shims, we inserted them, and then mixed up lime mortar and started, uh, started bedding all the stone. Now that's a white mortar, that's called the bedding mortar, that's the mortar that's hidden. And you can hear the sounds of redding there, obviously. Um, that, that was the soundtrack pretty much all the time. But yeah, we, uh, we started putting it in. That's, that's the, the stone work just bedded into the end column. Now you remember what that looked like, right? And so we put these big tie stones in now that go across and they, they tie the back wide of, of the wall or the back wall to the front wide of the wall. And then we ended up putting the, uh, the ridge joint on to match everything we did on the other side um, and profiled that so that no one would know what we did. And, um, and there's a before picture showing the plaster that was trapping all the water. But uh, the guys just did a great job, uh, the young guys that work with me. And um, I mean, I had the material to work with, which was really awesome. And I'm telling you, the stones were within an inch or two, sometimes a half inch of what I needed. And so, and then we put copper drip edges in so that as the water hits, it deflects down. We did this in a few areas. Okay, and then we, we had a broken capstone up at the top, about 50 feet up. So this picture kind of goes up and you can see the last stone there. This stone, it was all spider cracked and it was actually over on this side here. And what Logan's holding in his hand is the original 1820s brick. Because the, the front of this building used to be a brick facade, but then they changed it in 1862 uh, to a uh, brownstone facade. So they tore the bricks down, but they left the backer wall, which looks like limestone. That blue stone is limestone. And then they tied in the new stone wall here and they built this whole, uh, the whole tower right here. So you get a chance to really see the inside construction there. Of course, that metal right there, that's called the flashing. And that's actually called counter flashing. So that goes in underneath the capstone. And then when, when it rains, that keeps the rain from getting in under the roof. That's how that works. Good job. So we removed the old stone and that's what it looked like when we took it apart. We didn't even put a jackhammer on that or anything, you know, it just fell apart. We made a new one, which is on that purple strap and we pulled it all the way up to the top on a hoist. Um, got it up top there and it fit perfect. Uh, and then we bed it in lime mortar and after we bedded in the mortar, we put a copper flashing at that connection there because that is a connection where you could have movement and where water could start getting in again. So copper and metal just help to uh, provide a water barrier. What do you think broke the tower though? Uh, I think it was the drip, the constant drip from the tower for 160 some years in one place because you can see the drip edge right there. And you know, natural stone has its own little uh, fissures in and things like that. So this is the, some of the completed work. Uh, you can see all the the ruled joint there, and um, and so uh, that should be good for a good long time now. Um, so let's go on to part three. And are you guys okay? Are you hanging in there? Okay. Is it too loud or is it decent? Okay. All right. So this is basically when we had the 125 foot. Uh, man lift on the front of the church. Did anybody drive by when we were doing that? Did anybody see that happening? Uh, and let me tell you, you know how they say there's no atheists in a foxhole? <laughs> I don't think there are in man lifts in the middle of Reading when traffic starts going the wrong way and traffic is, 
I mean, that happened when we were all the way up about 100 feet. A city bus turned, even though we had signage up, we had a professional uh, you know, traffic control company stop the traffic and re-divert it, but people were so used to making this left-hand turn that a city bus turned and then about five cars followed them and cars were coming the other way and we're up top just watching this and we had a few people, including my father on the ground and uh, yeah, I'm just grateful that God protected us. So, so here's a shot of uh, that work and this work needs to be very, you know, obviously you gotta be really careful because of the wind. Uh, so we did this in December and there was winds maybe like four miles an hour, but it gets very windy up high, so you have to be really careful, especially next to a glass box with law firms in. So um, now uh, we have a couple of pictures here, the biological growth uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the tree that's growing there. And now this is another little video. This isn't as long as the other one, so... Uh, this is what we found when we were up top there. And we're going to go wide angle. We can get a chance to see what's going on in between the gargoyles. On this side, we can see some pretty severe deterioration in this area. Biological growth right here. This is the north side. So this is this side towards m &T. This is actually the worst side of the building where we see a lot of expansion happening with the stonework. And a lot of this is because there's open joints and the open water joints are, mortar joints are just allowing water to go inside. is cracking. See that up there. Let's see if I can zoom in on that. Large mortar joint open is probably feeding all this. Loss of mortar all over. stone breaking up in this area. That used to have ornamentation on the front and it's, it's been erased now from um, the weathering. This was something that, now the upper spire it's in fairly good shape, but down on the bottom, there's, you see that running crack that someone had previously repaired? This is the front of the church here facing 5th Street, and you can see the erosion of the cement mortars on these areas where the water is just running over the face of the stone. I think it's probably one of the best examples of you know what happens with cement mortar. You can see there how it's completely eroded away the stone and the mortar is still there. And it just shows you that the, the actual uh, mortar is not allowing any kind of breathability. So, um, you know, we really see a lot of that happening above the keystone here. And uh, you can see how it's just washing away the face of the stone over time there's a lot of concentrated water that comes off of this this drip edge right here uh, from the spire face here we have the tree it's right in the middle of the column we're gonna get a rope around it get it out of here all right so we are up here we just removed the tree and you can see the deterioration on these columns here the spire itself actually remarkably doesn't seem to have a ton of deterioration there's a little bit of deterioration of that stone right there underneath the sill we can see um, but from what I see here there's the original ridge joint Michael why don't you point to that see that that's that ridge joint uh, looks like they did just a regular ridge joint up here they didn't get too fancy with the overhung ridge joint evidently um, we do see uh, some graffiti over here we see an H carved into the stone see that H there and then over here on the same side we also see another H right there 
which I don't know what the significance of that is, but. Uh, what I am seeing is a lot of, a lot of these rusting nails. It looks like they put uh, some sort of cheap nail in, they hammered them in for the pigeon spikes. And those will have to, at some point, be removed because they're not doing anything except destroying the masonry. And you can see here on this one how those spikes are um, embedded into the front and to the bottom here. And that eventually will cause the stone to split. And then this originally had some sort of uh, finial on top of the front of this element here. We can see the gargoyles at the top of them. You can see right there, there's a little iron spot, uh, spike that's sticking up. And there was some sort of uh, finial on top there that's been lost to history there. Uh, we did get that cut down. There is no way to get that out of the center of the wall. So we're gonna spray it with an herbicide and hopefully that will help to do its job and take it out. But um, really, at some point during a real restoration project, that's just gonna have to be removed manually and maybe even remove part of the stone to get in there. You see all that black, black sealant and caulk in those areas? That should all be mortar, but somebody just, as they've gone up there, they've just kind of patched it in. But that's really where the water's getting in and then transmitting down to the bottom part. So we did our best job to cut it. Uh, actually probably ended up damaging the, the blade cutting it because it's embedded into the stone at this point. See that right there. We're gonna give that a spray down, try to brush some of this uh, material out of here. Anything else we see that we wanna point out? Oh, it looks like part of that ornamentation has fallen off right there. See the top part, it's broken. And we can also see the major cracking. You see those I, those nails? Little nails are splitting the face of the stone, right? Almost off. acting like those feathers and wedges that we use, where they're they put them in a line and they hammered them in, and it looks like it's splitting the stone. Really advanced, extreme advanced uh, deterioration on this lower level because of this drip edge here, having all these open mortar joints and it's really causing this beautiful ornamentation to be eroded pretty quickly. Um, we have a lot of caulking here where people have done poor repairs, kind of quick repairs, you know, through time. Uh, people have been doing caulking. Of course, you have the cement and then you have the original lime mortars right there. So, a lot of caulking on this side as well. Keep going. That's Roundup, if anybody want, is wondering what it is. We're wearing respirators because we're super careful with that stuff. I could just spray all that down. Fortunately, I wasn't videoing while you were spraying. Oh, okay. <laughs> but he sprayed all these areas here. And we treated this. the skyline right here the city they were put in because somebody put stainless steel bird spikes up there pigeon spikes they're like a small they're like a spike that keeps pigeons from landing um, now this is uh, this is a fissure in the the ox uh, gargoyle right there on the front of the church it runs down and underneath uh, but yeah those spikes were put in quite some time ago the detail is incredible on the on the carvings up there. It's all right. So right here we have pretty significant cracking on the inside of this floral um, triangle, I guess you could say. Up top here, these stones crack is right down below here. Uh, we can see. 
This is on that side of the tower, water the entry south point, side. Major water entry point right here. See how open the joints are on that side there? And what's happening to the stone? That stone's completely deteriorated. Stone work in the area right below the drip edge. Okay, we can see uh, a fairly large crack here, a running crack that goes from this joint all the way through this stone. And That's on the base of the spire. Right, right here. here. Over here is where we have the tree stump. We sprayed it multiple, multiple times, cut it down as far as we could. So one of the things we just saw on this floral uh, stone at the top, it's got a pretty big fissure right at the top. And then the fissure continues down along the side on 5th Street side. And it's there's some sort of iron band uh, that we can see there. But essentially that crack, that part of the stone is ready to come right off uh, from the top down. And that is on the street side. So we're in pretty close here and we can see this crack that is going, looks like it's going through the stone right here, traveling down along uh, the next stone and then into the top wing of the gargoyle right there. You can see the uh, cracking on this side as well. That's a really good shot of that. Something you can't really see unless you're right up against it. And the way you would repair cracks like that is something called grout injection. There's those bird spikes, you can see them. They're like a stainless steel spike. Uh, that, there was a fissure in that crack right there. Um, so you actually take a, what's like a horse needle and you inject it with uh, a, what's called micro grout injection and you can fill those, those voids in. Well, we just wanted to get a video of uh, straight down 5th Street here. We have uh, the Lutheran Church over here, we have City Hall. And we have the buses going down through. Just a nice, nice viewpoint up here. Nice perspective. See all the way down the main drag. And I, you, you can see the shadow of the tower falling on the building over there, which was really cool to see. So now Dave Rodriguez just shot some drone footage the other day, and I wanted to give you guys a feel of how tall this thing is. Um, so you'll see that's about the 50 foot level and we're going up to the 100 foot level, which is where we were shooting most of that video uh, from the, the lift. And we're not done yet, so. <laughs> How does that make you feel when you, you start feeling like you're up that high? It's something, huh? So there's the top, from the top down, we're coming down, you can see Trinity, that side. So this is just basically a shot of, I wanted to see what the west side of the tower looked like. Um, now, the north and the east sides of towers usually are in uh, the worst conditions just because of the rain and the north side really, which is this side, really doesn't get any sun. Um, so that's where you see a lot of deterioration. Um, there was a crack directly right above there at the base of the spire. Actually, it's up a little bit, it's up about 40 feet or so. 
Um, the west side didn't look all that bad. I mean, it was the typical type of deterioration that we've been seeing, but I think because it gets sunlight and it's able to dry out, uh, it's not as bad as what we see on the north side and the east side, which, which face uh, Fifth Street. So that cement mortar was used everywhere, all the way up to Staples? Yes, it was, yep. I think that might be uh, that might be roof cement that somebody painted red. I don't know. Um, I think that might be pretty much the end of the video there. because a few of those stones, we should really extract a stone, put a new stone in. Uh, it's gonna be the best repair, especially for that kind of uh, you know, construction, the steeple, the height. Um, whenever we do our repairs, and the reason why we use these mortars, these specialty mortars from France, is because they've been used for centuries, and you wanna repair this once. This isn't like, oh, we'll be back you know, next year. Um, you, know, you, you make a repair that it's good for the next 50 to 75 years, hopefully, maybe even longer. So the main spire, aside from uh, two visual cracks, actually there's a third crack on this side, I wrote this before I had seen that, um, does not have as much deterioration. I think it's because it's like that pyramid shape, that cone shape, and basically as it comes down, it just sheds water. But what happens is, is that you're really seeing a deterioration from about the 100, probably about the 110 foot level down. Um, all, all elevations have deteriorations. Uh, the M&T bank side, the north side is the worst. The east side obviously has some uh, deterioration as well, and the south. Uh, and you can see the loss of uh, ornamentation, cement mortar sealants, and rusting nails are advancing that deterioration. Um, biological growth, you know, somebody asked, you know, once we took out the tree and we took all the biological growth, well, is it gonna come back? Well, we can treat it with Roundup, but probably eventually it will come back because the real problem is, is that the building's kind of speaking to you and they're say, it's saying like it's, it's waterlogged, it's trapped with moisture. So that's why there's a rooftop garden up there sometimes. So the open mortar joints allow water into the walls, but they magnify the, the detrimental effect of the freeze thaw because when you get to the time of the year where you get water in the walls and then the freeze happens, it obviously, frost can expand uh, the pores of the stone. So these are recommendations uh, that I would give for preservation work in the future. Uh, and when you look at a building like this, you know, you've heard the old, uh, the old adage, you eat an elephant one bite at a time, and that's really what you'd have to do on this building. You would start on the worst elevations and you'd prioritize those elevations. And I would say the north and the east side are the worst elevations. And you basically have a scaffolding section that would go up to probably about the 100, 115 foot level, and you restore one whole side. And we would wrap the scaffolding, I would envision wrapping the scaffolding around um, to encapsulate the buttresses, so you take care of the, the gargoyles and the ornamentation on the east side and also on the uh, west side as well. Um, and you divide it up into a phase maintenance plan. Um, and once you get the bottom stabilized, you can think about the spire at that point. Um, the spire looks like it needs mostly just repointing. Uh, there are a few cracks that would need to be addressed as well. Um, so going forward, you know, it would be to develop a plan of action for restoration. Um, now with scaffolding, I don't know if you noticed our scaffolding out here, but it had a debris netting all around it. So we encapsulate everything. We, we don't let, we don't let anything drop to the ground. We catch everything on that level. Um, you need to be concerned about pedestrians. You need to be concerned about damaging things like stained glass windows. We have them covered in foam. Um, so the scaffolding would actually have a cover over it that people can walk underneath and, and be protected. Um, now we would possibly uh, also do cleaning techniques if that's something the church is interested in, which would involve, uh, there's actually a drip system that it's kind of like a misting system that you would see in a grocery store where it, your produce gets misted. And you set up this misting system that doesn't use any chemicals, but it just sprays water um, every 15 minutes on the wall for 
a few hours and then you can rinse over that and it loosens the dirt naturally. Uh, you wanna make sure you don't damage anything. Uh, so you have to be really gentle with anything uh, regarding cleaning because it's already in a state like that that, that needs uh, work. So it would also involve uh, a restoration process, would involve obviously repointing, brownstone consolidation, which there's some uh, consolidants that can help to restore that, the stone matrix and gives it uh, strength. They're uh, consolidants that have been used over in Europe on a lot of uh, restoration work for years. There's actually a German company that makes those. Um, there's stone repair like we did out back with you know patching techniques. Obviously stone replacement is the best. Stainless steel structural ties, you put those in. Micro grout injection, which involves injecting with like a, essentially like a horse needle, you inject uh, a grout into those fissures and fill up the void and conserve the, the, the stone ornamentation. Copper flashings and removal of anything that's gonna rust and expand like the nail embedments. Um, and then we would review plans with structural engineer and preservation architects. So that is, uh, that's kind of an overall restoration plan. Um, I wanna say thank you to God, first of all, because he's the one that, you know, he gives us wisdom for our work. And, um, you know, I see God's hand in providing um, the materials as well, like I told you, uh, to have the exact materials at the exact time. A guy that, Dave Tallarico was his name, he sat on, uh, the Harb uh, meeting, and he had never sat on that in, the, in on that meeting before. He was actually filling in for someone. And so it happened to be the day that I was speaking. I was talking about brownstone and restoring the church. And he said, I have brownstone from like eight years ago, you know? So that's, I kind of see God's hand in that. You know, I can see that he cares about the hairs on our head and he cares about brownstone for just the right size for restoring a church. So. I wanna thank the Lord for that. And obviously protection, you know, it is dangerous work when you have the chainsaws running and moving big stone and uh, can, be, can be pretty uh, dangerous in some aspects. So these are all the people that helped with this project or organizations and um, I could read through them or I could just let you look and see if your name's there. If I forgot your name, please forgive me because uh, I might not have known that you had helped, but um, obviously Cliff and everyone else with the vestry and people you know, from the Harb and Dave Rodriguez. And um, of course, I really need to thank um, the scaffolding guys, Limeworks that provided the materials and uh, my son and Micah. Uh, and I have another uh, Ben Stella, another young guy that works with us. Um, and so, yeah, just really want to thank you guys for, for the work. And thanks for hanging in there on a Sunday afternoon when I'm sure you're hungry uh, watching videos. So if anybody has any questions, you know, you can feel free to ask questions. What is the cross made out of? The cross? That looks like it's copper. It might be, uh, might be brass or bronze, but I'm, I'm sure it's probably it's clad in copper. Or, um, but like I said, it has that big rod running all the way down. So the other night when the wind came through, and I, I don't know if you heard the wind come through, I live out near Kempton, and so the wind came through, and, and I was thinking, wow. I, I could, all I can think about is the steeple sometimes, because it's incredible the way they designed this. Uh, and they, they were basically basing it on, you know, years and years of, of knowledge that was passed down generationally to build a structure like this. And it's really a work of art, I think. Um, when I look at this tower, the more time I spent here, I really, it helps me to think about the majesty of God, helps me to think about the greatness of him, um, and also just, you know, all those symbolic things that mean something about really who Jesus is, you know? I mean, Jesus, no one spoke like Jesus, and um, the things that he said, um, they're etched into stone up there, which is pretty cool. It's a tremendous work of art, and um, I mean, they just, they don't build them like this anymore, let's just say, so, but uh, is that good? Any other questions? Sure. Sure, thanks. Thank Logan. <laughs>